morning. Good morning. Well, lovely to see you. Oh, lots of familiar faces. What could be better? Um, can you hear me? Is the, okay, that's very important. Up. Up. Is that better? Yeah. Good, good, good. Um, I'm going to be unmasked for this um, because I want to reveal all. But uh, Shelley has asked me to encourage you, please, to wear masks indoors, that there are those of us who are on the frail end of things, and <laughs> you protect us, even though you may be quadruple vaccinated. You protect us if you wear your mask. Thank you very much. Uh, this paper is entitled Susie Clemens, The Final Years. The purpose of this paper for me is to look closely at Susie Clemens' life in her final uh, uh, years from the age of 18 to 24. From the years 1890 when she entered Bryn Mawr to 1896 when she died unexpectedly of spinal meningitis. I'm interested in understanding how she was developing a sense of herself in the passage from girlhood to early adulthood and what that journey was like for her. It was not a smooth passage, nor one that has received much attention, and therefore I call my attention to it and yours today. In 1890, at the age of 18, Susie began to prepare for Bryn Mawr's very, very challenging entrance exams in six different subjects. She was tutored by Harriet Foote, sister of Lily Foote, who had been a governess in the Clemens household in the early 1880s. More about Lily Foote later in the talk. She passed the exams, enrolled in Bryn Mawr in the fall of 1890, and almost immediately began to call herself Olivia with her new friends and her classmates. Her separation from her family was not an easy one for any of them, and there are a number of references to her initially being homesick. But she made her way at Bryn Mawr, where because of her singing ability, um, she was chosen to play a lead role as Phyllis in the production of Gilbert and Sullivan's comic opera, Ireland, which I have read, and I'm sorry I missed it, but. Um, Susie became part of a small group of friends and most significantly fell in love with a more senior student and student leader, Louise Brownell. Theirs was a passionate and mutual relationship, and Louise, in fact, invited Susie to room with her the following year, but that never happened. Instead, Susie was called home to Hartford in April of that first year, and on June 5th, left with her family for an extended stay in Europe. Biographers have debated why precisely Susie left Bryn Mawr in April, but this much we do know for certain. Sam and Livy, and I will call them that because it's easier, um, as early as the fall of 1890 had been anticipating closing down the Hartford House and moving to Europe to reduce their living expenses made necessary by their ever-growing debt. Their actual leaving was by no means spontaneous, as Gary Scharnhorst has established. It took considerable planning to close down the Hartford House to assist long-term faithful employees in finding new positions and to make future plans. There was no way they were going to leave Susie behind, nor any way she would have wanted to have been separated in this way from her family for the foreseeable future. So in June of 1891, she sailed with her family to Europe, where they would remain for the next four years. We owe much, if not all, of our knowledge about the relationship between Susie and Louise to the fact that they were many miles apart, which meant Susie wrote 38 extant, intimate, and personally revealing letters to Louise, all of which Louise saved, and which are now in the archives at Hamilton College. Susie's letters make it clear that Louise wrote almost equal number to her but not one of them remains. Were they lost in travel? Did the family destroy them? We simply do not know. Let me briefly describe the intimacy contained in Susie's letter for those who might not be familiar with their content. 
Some of what Susie says about the relationship is especially touching and loving, I find. When Bryn Mawr began again in the fall of 1891, for example, Susie wrote, I think of you these days, the first of college, if I could only look in on you. We would sleep together tonight, and I would allow you opportunities for those refreshing little naps you always indulged in when we passed a night together. A few days later, she wrote, My darling, I love you so, and I feel so separated from you. If you were here, I would kiss you hard on that little place that tastes so good, just on the right side of your nose. Goodbye. I give myself to you over and over again to make sure there is no mistake we belong to each other. You are my own dear, dear darling. Susie also often spoke of being lonely in these letters and bored by constant reading and sewing, as though little else were going on. One of my personal, personal favorite letters is one in which Susie tells Louise that Aunt Sue, that would be Susan Crane, who had been visiting, has gone back home without getting Susie's, quote, blood to rise in revolt against you because of some comment of Sue's that Susie quoted in turn to Louise. We don't know what that comment was, but it suggests to me that Aunt Sue might have understood the relationship between Susie and Louise more fully than it appears Lily Livy did. We do not know, I'm mean, sorry, we do know that in 1894, Susie was allowed to travel to London to meet up with Louise, who was studying there on a postgraduate fellowship from Bryn Mawr. But we know very little of the nature of their reunion, except that she reveals in one final letter to Louise, in which she panics at the thought that they are not going to meet up in Paris as she had anticipated. Um, this letter, which is almost painful to read because of how Susie begs Louise to let her see her one more time. But nonetheless, it ends on this note. Good night, darling, darling, my beloved. I take you in my arms and see you clearly as you were in London. What a fated friendship ours is. Oh, I long for you so. The loneliness of life is the hardest. Yours forever and ever. It would be 1896 before they were united again, this time in Elmira at Quarry Farm under Aunt Sue's watchful eye. We learn much about Susie's life abroad through a series of letters she wrote to her sister Clara, who spent much of her time studying music in Berlin away from the family. These letters are even more personally revealing than her letters to Louise, and among other things she writes about, though does not explain, is growing tensions between herself and her father. Most pointedly, she complains to Claire that she doesn't want to, quote, go down to breakfast because her father, quote, pierces me through with his eyes as if he were determined to see whether I'm embarrassed or not. Oh, well, I will keep sewing and reading and trying to make the best of everything, but I must say it's a good deal of an effort. Elsewhere, she advises Clara in the most emphatic terms not to even think about leaving Berlin and returning to the family in Italy. I really cannot bear to have you make the experiment, for I sure feel sure you would be so unhappy. Of course, I can only judge from my experience. I am contented here much of the time and satisfied, but with me it is different for entre nous. I have rather given up expecting much real happiness, constructed as I am, and all. But you have your music, your work, your talent, and your natural good luck, so why should you come here when you may as well stay in a gayer, freer place? Clara, my dear Clara, be careful what you do. You know how you will be fretted here by the family's discipline after the freedom of the Willard School. You seem to forget the life of the Villa Viviani. What are you thinking of? From time to time, she reports to Clara that she's getting on well with her singing lessons, and but mostly her letters reveal that she was frequently bored and lonely. Read, so, read, so. Florence, she describes as the most uninteresting and tiresome 
place on earth, while at another time she declares that she's become awfully fond of Florence. For me, the sense of Susie that emerges in this period, her early 20s, is a relatively unhappy and insecure person who's bright, articulate, but full of self-doubts. She was certainly bored by her very limited social life and isolation, and at least by her own reports, not especially committed to enhancing her singing career, compared especially with Clara's pursuit of music, music in Berlin. Meanwhile, there were growing indications that her health was declining. In 1893, she was taking singing lessons, but became short of breath while singing. She also was not sleeping well. Her teacher said she was, quote, self-starved, while her doctor proclaimed that her chest was not fully developed. An especially discouraging letter from Livy to her dear friend Alice Hooker Day declared that Susie's hope for successful singing lessons in France have now been ruined, has not been at all well this winter. In fact, her winter has been entirely spoiled for her. She has had to give up her singing lessons. When we reached here in the fall, she was in superb voice, but she had only taken lessons before her voice began to grow weaker. And now for two months, she has taken no lessons. It has been a most bitter disappointment to the child, and in fact, to all of us. As the family's financial situation declined even further, Sam began to contemplate undergoing an extended speaking tour to Australia, India, and South Africa. Africa. According to Gary Scharnhorst, he first contemplated such a trip in the fall of 1893. A year later, in 1894, he contacted James Pond about such a trip, who in turn connected him to Robert Sparrow Smith, who had managed Henry Stanley's Australian engagement four years earlier, and so it went from there. In May of 1895, the Clements family came home from Europe and went to Quarry Farm, anticipating the upcoming world tour. It was there, or should I say here, <laughs> that the family made the surprising decision to allow Susie to remain behind um, with Aunt Sue in Elmira, while Clara accompanied her mother and father on their extended trip. If Susie was to stay at Quarry Farm, Jean would as well, where she could continue her schooling. Katie Leary, who worked for the Clemens family for many years and was a trusted friend, confirmed that it was Susie herself who made the decision not to accompany her parents on their trip, a decision she later frequently regretted. In Katie's telling of the story, the decision was so Susie could stay home and get stronger and therefore be able to sing better. Sam said that she stayed home because uh, she hates the sea. Well, Clara later stated that Susie preferred the comforts of home to uncertain joys of India and Africa. On June 14, 1895, Sam, Livy, and Clara left for their tour, planning for all to be reunited in a year's time. Tragically, this reunion was never to take place. Again, in the meantime, much of what we know about Susie's activities and feelings during this period turned out to be, which turned out to be her final year, are based on letters to Clara, but also from Livy's letters, from the writings of Katie Leary, and from bits and pieces of biographies. One of the themes that runs through Susie's letter to Clara once again is being bored, or as she wrote at one point, things go on here just as they did, pleasantly, evenly, absolutely, uneventfully. Uh, apparently it was not always uneventful, and I will quote one of what, for me, is one of the most disturbed and disturbing letters that Susie wrote to Clara, because it reveals her rather extreme frustration and avowed dislike of Aunt Sue. I do not really love anybody but you, dear three, and of course nobody else loves me. I get on perfectly with Aunt Sue, never a hitch or a jar between us, but this is because I never think of doing anything but singing her praises from morning till night. Even Jean said, you are never rude or disagreeable to Aunt Sue, which is because I always play a part with her. I cannot 
respect her or love her. Her behavior towards Ernest disgusts me. If anyone else, in anyone else, it would create gossip. He spends the evenings uh, with her in her bedroom and talks with her long talks on the front porch. She smiles and smirks at him as if he were her lover. And she interrupts me no matter what I am saying in order to speak with him when he comes in from the pantry even with some butter or bread. I never have a visit with Aunt Sue because I will not sit near him. So he takes on her evenings and I flee to my own room. Yet, I want you to understand, I get on perfectly. And there is no discord between Aunt Sue and me, although she really insults me at the table by ignoring me and talking almost exclusively to him. My opinion of Aunt Sue remains what it was in Europe. I don't suppose I ought to write this, and don't show it to Mama if it would offend her, and on no account to Papa. Mama is a great woman, and Aunt Sue is infinitely little. Elsewhere, Susie writes explicitly of her disappointment in herself. I am often deeply cast down with the thought of how I have failed to be what I should have been to you all. This realization takes possession of me and horrifies me often in the middle of the night. What I personally find different about Susie's self-doubt and self-dissatisfaction now compared to her time in Florence is that she begins actively to seek to change herself. The terms in which she expresses this determination, again, while painful to read and hear, nonetheless show a genuine desire to change. I have become determined to get hold of a philosophy that will, if possible, straighten me out morally, mentally, and physically, and make me less of a burden to myself and others. I am tired, tired of all my sins and all myself. This hitch, this discord, this restlessness, making ever, every undertaking impossible, and spoiling and frittering away my life. Why should it not all be trampled underfoot and annihilated? I have also written Miss Foote a questionnaire, questioning letter about mind cure and hope that she's going to help me. I am, of course, as a scholar and a Twain fan, um, aware of how the family came to view Susie's involvement with mental science in spite of their initially having encouraged her to engage with it to seek help for her physical and emotional problems. In particular, Sam urged her to seek out help from Lily Foote, which she did. But in the end, Sam, Livy, and Clara all blamed mental science for her death. No one said so more forcefully than Clara in a letter to a longtime friend, Alice Hooker Day. Susie, you know, was simply killed by mental science and spiritualism without the least exaggeration. A murder it was. A demented, cold-blooded, unforgivable murder. Now, in the face of this, and knowing all this, I, and how the family came to understand her death, I have nonetheless come to believe that Susie's involvement with mental science had a positive effect on her in the final year of her life. Certainly, she believes so. She seemed to become more self-assured, and the difference in the tone of her letters to Clara between September 1895 and the December of that year is striking. For instance, she reported that thanks to mental science, she got on finally at a Christmas ball. Then she reported to Clara that she herself was offering mental science, quote, treatments to others. More explicitly that month, she reported to Clara, I have learned how to meet people with ease and comfort through the help of mental science. One doesn't have to control one's external manner. It may be quiet or talkative, but the inner attitude must be right, and then the real poise is felt. My relations with people here in Orange, New Jersey have been more satisfactory than I have had at any time or with any people in the past. My intercourse with youths has also been greatly facilitated. It is all very curious and interesting 
but to understand the law of attracting and becoming people is a blessing. Uh, she also visited uh, with Louise in New York, with Louise, Susie staying for three weeks with the William Dean Howells family. Uh, the truth is, she said, I had success foo in New York, thanks to mental science, and without the help or presence of that mighty power, the gray guanawi, that is to say, the gray frog, that is to say, her father. <laughs> this is a curious reference indeed, indicating, I believe, the way in which her father's influence, power, haunted her, but suggesting, too, that she was beginning to feel that she was coming into her own. I have to believe, too, that she, re that renewed interest in interpersonal contact with Louise had a positive effect on her sense of self. There's indication, too, that her singing ability and strength were progressing as witnessed by some who knew her well during her final days in Hartford. For example, here's Katie Leary's report. I took a little apartment on Spring Street. I lived in it, and Susie came over every day to do practicing. People used to listen to her from the street, and I remember one boy who used to come every day to listen. Well, there was always a crowd outside in the street listening to Susie sing, for she had a wonderful voice, and really, we had a concert every afternoon. And then secondly, there's this tribute from one of the family Hartford friends, Lily Warner, writing to her sister-in-law regarding the death of Susie. I wish you could have seen her in her maturity and have heard her great, powerful voice, so great that her listeners would always say in astonishment, looking at her fragile body, where does it come from? I will not rehearse the final days of Susie's life, only to remind you that she was literally packing to go to New York to sail to Europe to rejoin her parents and sister when she became gravely ill with spinal meningitis. She died in the family Hartford home with Katie Leary and her aunt and uncle at her side and with her mother and sister on a ship bound for New York, not imagining, in fact, that she was close to death. Even though a doctor was called in to treat her, reportedly the best doctor in Hartford, there was nothing medical science could do in that era to stop the course of meningitis, be it viral or bacterial in origin. There were as yet no antibiotics to treat the bacterial form, and even now there is no fully reliable treatment for viral meningitis. To say that both her parents were devastated by her death is truly an understatement. Her father's response and profound sense of loss have been well articulated and well documented. But I believe we still have much more to learn about the full effect of this terrible death on Susie's mother, Livy. But that's the work of another day. Thank you.